But Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When you have it, say amen. I like to thank the pastor for this opportunity to bring forth the word of God. It truly is an honor and a privilege to bring amen. forth the word of God and stand behind the sacred desk. When we look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, this is not an unfamiliar passage to any of us by any means. In fact, this is the Pentecostal passage. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the Bible states, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mushy, rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire that sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. As we look at this passage, it is not all common to us, but if we would step back a little bit further in time, Jesus Christ would be having a little conversation with his disciples, and he would say, you know, the Holy Ghost that you feel right now, he's not always going to be the same as he is right now. For as you feel him in your midst, he is with you. But there is coming a point in time when the operation of the Holy Ghost in his office is going to change. And the Holy Ghost that you feel right now that is with you, it is going to change. And there's going to be a day that comes when he is no longer just with you, but he shall be in you. For this is the promise of the Father that we find in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, where the Bible says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. You see these disciples here in Acts chapter 2. They had a little while to get there when Jesus said this. He said that he is with you, but he shall be in you. But we have you find after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he tells them, go and tarry in Jerusalem. For the time of the descending of the Holy Ghost, the baptism is upon you. He is very close, but before he comes, you must go and wait for him. Wait in Jerusalem. And we know what happens there. We find that there is 40 days past the fat Passover, and they are there dwelling in this upper room, waiting for the Holy Ghost to descend, to descend upon them. We find that maybe they were going about the feast and the preparation there. Some believe that they were just in the upper room in a house as they were preparing for the feast of Passover. But if you study it out, you might come to the same conclusion that I have, that they were not in the upper room of a house, but that they were in the upper room of a temple, and they were there praying, waiting on God. They were waiting for the promise of the Father. And as they were waiting on for the promise of the Father, in Acts chapter 2, they were there in the upper room, all 120 of them. And it wasn't just men, as the Jewish culture would have been, but the women were waiting with there with them also. They were in the upper room. They were waiting. They were praying. They said, they all I know that God said the promise is coming, but he said to go and wait in Jerusalem. So we're going to wait here, and we're going to carry. We may not have seen the evidence of it yet, but we know that the Holy Ghost is coming, Sister Susan. We don't know when, we don't know how, but we know that he said that he is with us, but there is coming a point in time that he shall be in us. And there, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 2, we know that that there, while they were waiting and they were praying, that suddenly it didn't come with a 10-minute warning. It didn't come with a 5-minute warning. But suddenly it was there. Suddenly the power of the Holy Ghost was there. And how was it evidence? It was evidence by a mighty rushing wind. And we were looking around our own world. We would find that those times of refreshing come in those summer months as we're out working. And we wait for that calm, steady breeze to come across. Something to comfort us. Something to cool us down a little bit. Something to come our way. And something to come our way to indicate that times of refreshing are coming. But what is a wind coming by for? Many times when we feel that breeze coming by and that wind coming by, if we would look up, we would see the clouds in the sky start to form and they might start getting a little bit gray. What is that indicating? It 
is indicating that something else is coming. It's not just the wind coming, but the wind is indicative that there is something greater already on its way. When we look in Acts chapter 2, that is exactly what we find is coming. We find that there was a sound from heaven and a mighty rushing wind. That mighty rushing wind was saying, hold on, boys, that promise that you've been waiting for is coming. Those times are in Russian that you've been waiting for is coming. For God, there is a sound coming from the throne room of heaven where God is saying, the Holy Ghost is on its way. Hold on a little bit longer, boys. That promise of the Father that I said was coming your way, it's coming in that mighty Russian way.
It's not going to come in the wind. The wind is symbolizing and telling us that there's something greater coming. But it's going to come in the fire. When we look at fire in the Word of God, we find that God is a jealous God and He told us not to have no other gods before us. For He is a jealous God in Exodus 34 and verse 14. And in Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 3, He said, Understand therefore this, this day that the Lord thy God, which doth, which goes over before thee as a consuming fire, he shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy fight faith. So shalt thou drive out them out. <coughs> which goes over before thee. As a consuming fire, he shall destroy them. <coughs> And shall bring them down before thy face, so shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said unto thee. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. If we're going to have the fire, power of the Holy Ghost in our life, we need to experience two fires in our life. And the very first one is the consuming fire of God. Is there any sin in my life? Is there anything preventing the power of the Holy Ghost to move in my life and fill me? Maybe it's not sin, but maybe it's God. I want to have control over this section of my life, and I don't want to give it to you. God, there's nothing wrong with this area of my life. I know that there is no sin there, but I want to keep this portion for myself. And we're going to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We must let God try us by fire as a consuming fire. That if there's anything in our life that would prevent Him from filling us with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we say, God, not my will, but mine be done. Thy will be done. Take the fire. Let it consume every aspect of me. If there's any sin in my life, consume it and take it out. If there's anything in my life that I want to hold on to myself, even if it be not sin, but well, let me put it in your hand. For I want to experience you as Moses experienced him. Because that leads us to the next type of, type of fire, and that is the non-consuming fire. Once we even place everything in our God's hand, once we've placed everything about us in God's hand, and say, God, if you want to take this, take this. If you want to change me, change me. And then we can finally get to the point where we can experience God as the non-consuming fire. What is the non-consuming fire? It is experiencing the glory and the Shekinah glory of God. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mount of God, even to Oro. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, this is the non-consuming fire of God where he wants to come down and dwell with us. And the bush burned not, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that, he turned aside to see. God said unto him, out of the midst of the bush, and said to him, said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. What is this showing us? If we want to stand in the presence of God, we have to take off our earthly shoes. We have to take off our carnality. We have to put on our spirituality. We must take on Jesus Christ and say, not my will, but thine be done. If there's anything in my life, God, take it and consume it. For I want to stand and be on holy ground with you. For who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Only he that hath clean hand and a pure heart. God, I want to experience you as the non-consuming fire. I want to experience the non-consuming fire of God in my life. Because it's only then when I can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of other tongues. It's only then when I can stand in the presence of God and say, Lord, not my will, but thy may God, but thy will be done. It's only then when I can say, stay in the presence of God and say, God, is my heart pure? God, are my hands clean? Am I defiled in any way? Lord, let it be not so. May I be as Isaiah was and say, God, cleanse my lips. Take the coal from the altar. Cleanse everything about me because I want to be on holy ground with you, not because of who I am, but 
because I want to experience the fire of the Holy Ghost in my life where I can say, Lord, I am a living sacrifice. For you are holy. Do with me as you so desire. And may I be the sacrifice that was on Mount Carmel where you saturate me with the water of the Holy Ghost where you may consume me with the fire. And Lord, not just me, but everything about me. If the elders there consume the altar for I place every stone in my life at your feet, Lord. And I lay myself across the altar, Lord. And in the words of Isaac, Lord, whatever you have me to be, I am at your disposal. Lord, fill me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of other tongues. Let the fire fall fresh on me. May I be pure and holy in your sight. Because you realize when we have the wind come by and refresh us, it's just symbolizing that the fire is about to come. And when we experience the fire, there's something else that comes with the fire. It's not just a matter of being consumed. But Jesus said, I have come and I've taken from the enemy. And I have come to give the gifts unto men. Because in Acts chapter 2 and verse 3, we know that the fire sat on them like flowing tongues. And each one of them spake in a different tongue. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Scripture, as the Spirit, gave them evidence. But you realize that there's something else to hold on. That once the wind came by and said the Holy Ghost is coming, and once the Holy Ghost has already come, there's something that happened to these guys. There came a change in their life. Peter was once sent by a fire, warming himself one day. And there came along a little girl and said, aren't you a follower of Jesus Christ? Aren't you one of the disciples? Are you one of those men that was there when he healed the sick and he made the blind to see? Weren't you there when uh, he said unto him, arise, take up thy bed and walk? Aren't you one who calls yourself a Christian? And Peter said, no, not me. I don't know what you're talking about. But if we go to Acts chapter 2, all of a sudden, that coward became completely different. He became bold. He became powerful. Why did he become bold? Why did he become powerful? It is a fire of the Holy Ghost that consumed him as a living sacrifice on the outside, Sister Susie. Well, and became a non-consuming fire within his glory. And it was a well, a spring of living water that came up out of his stomach. And that Holy Ghost boldness began to follow Peter. And on the day of Pentecost, there were those that came up and scoffed and mocked and said that they've been in the bottle already. They're a little bit tipsy. They're a little bit drunk. And Peter rose up and said, you have no idea what you're talking about. We have experienced the wind, but it ain't something even greater. We have experienced the fire that it is flowing and dwelling inside of me. It is a non-consuming fire. But I tell you what, I can feel the Holy Ghost reaching out from my fingertips. And ye men of Galilee, you don't know what you speak of. For this same Jesus that came down, he came to save you. What you heard and read in the prophet Joel is kind of past before your very life, and you do not even recognize it because of the fire that came down. Amen. The power came Amen. and filled each one of them. And Peter spoke with boldness. Not only that, but in Acts. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. If we would read the passage here, we find that Pentecost has already happened. And they're on their way to the temple to pray. No other reason. But we come to give God the glory. We come to give Him the praise. We come to give Him all worship because it's due Him. But all of a sudden, there's a man. Sent by the gate, beautiful. He spent the year after year. He had to have somebody carry him there and place him at the gate, beautiful. And without thinking, 
taken, the Holy Ghost rose up within them as they were going to pray. And they said, Silver and gold have I none, but such have I have in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. What did they have? They had the fire of the Holy Ghost. And because they had the fire, they had the power of God residing within each one of them. Oh, if you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, there is a fire that comes with it. And with the fire comes the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And when the Holy Ghost fills us, He brings gifts unto men. See, when that day at Calvary, all of hell looked on because the Son of God was died on the tree. The Sadducees looked on. The Pharisees looked on. Jesus, others you saved, save yourself. The demons in hell knew better. The scribes and the Pharisees mocked. But the demons in hell did not dare mock, for they knew who hung upon the tree. For thou, Jesus, what have you to do? Have you come to torment us before our time? But the one who they thought was sent to torment them, they were watching on as he was being tormented upon the tree. And all the hell watched on, waiting for the Son of God to die. But as he was there on the cross, dying, we find in the Word of God that he made a show and a mockery of those demons openly with those words, it is finished. And when he gave up the ghost, every demon in hell realized at that moment what a mistake they made. Why? Because the Bible says that he made a show of them openly. If he studied it out, this show of them openly would be as a king who takes over another country. And he would take that king and his captives and his followers and his armies and he would chain them up or tie them up and lead them on prayer through the city saying, look what we've got. They couldn't hold us back. They couldn't keep us down. But we became victorious. But you realize what would come along with those prisoners as they would march around the city and through the city, showing openly that they were victorious over the enemy. There would be camels. There would be horses that would be followed. There would be wagons coming. What's in those horses? What's over those camels? What's in those wagons? Why is none other than the spoils of war? It's all those gold. It's all the treasures of the enemy. What was God doing on that day? He made a show of them openly. But not only that, he was telling the church, even though they were blind and had no idea, go and tarry in Jerusalem for the wagons are coming. The treasures are coming. The gifts are coming. All those things I took control over. All oh, that battle, you get control of your tongue to the devil. Why do you deny yourself? But guess what? On the day of Pentecost, the gift is coming back. I'm giving it back to you. I am giving you back your tongue. I am uniting the church with the human tongue. That the voice that was used for evil. I'm bringing it back. Do you remember the day Adam said and listened to the voice of the woman and partook of the fruit that sin entered into the world and was sin came to disease and sickness. Oh, look in the wagon. Look what I'm bringing you. It's the gift of healing. Oh, the voice of God that used to come down in the cool of the night that you would listen to and that you would speak to and you would know. Oh, look in the wagon back there. I'm bringing you the gift of knowledge. Oh, oh, when you thought that you could do things your own way and you forgot to rely on the voice of God. Oh, look in the wagon back there. I'm bringing you the gift of wisdom. Oh, that day when Christ died on the cross, you can almost hear in the distance, not only the enemy being on patrol, on patrol, on parade, but you can hear the roll, the wheels of the wagon turning. You can hear the horse beats of the foot as they're coming along behind the enemy. Oh, what are they doing? They're coming to Pentecost. Do you want the baptism of the Holy Ghost tonight? That Sister Beth comes to the piano, listen in the distance. Oh, the wagons are coming. The horses are coming. 
If you want the baptism tonight of the Holy Ghost, come up here and begin singing for him because he's already here. Don't bury your head in the pew, but say, God, 